representing places all over the world. So that's really exciting. And um, I think that this is a great um, group of people that we have on our panel to share some of their thoughts with you from all around the world. Um, our discussion tonight will be uh, Hometown Heroes, Encouraging Local Champions for Ocean Protection. And we have a really fabulous panel, so I will keep my comments brief. Uh, my name is Katherine Menjerink, and I'm the Executive Director of the Waite Institute. The Waite Institute is a US-based nonprofit organization uh, that works with governments and local organizations to support a prosperous blue future. And all of our, all of the places that we work are islands. So up until uh, the coronavirus drastically changed all of our lives, I spent about a third of my time on islands and working with people from islands. And so to me, this panel is really special because um, you get to hear from some of my favorite people that, that we work with at the Wade Institute. So let me first start with some logistics about how we're gonna run the panel. Um, I've asked each of the panel to provide a brief seven minute presentation on their work, why they've chosen the path they have to give you a sense of, of who they are, what motivates them and about how the work that they've done has changed and influenced the islands where they live. And then following each panelist, I'll ask a couple of questions, just a couple of brief questions. Then at the end of all the panelist presentations, if we've done our job right, we will still have 30 to 45 minutes for discussion. And to me, that's always the most interesting part uh, to hear from all of you and your questions and be able to uh, ask those questions of our panelists. So I'd ask all of you to please do ask questions. You can add them to the chat box or in the poll uh, section. So if you look at the, at the flowing under the unpathable, either the chat system or the poll system, and we'll pull questions from there. Um, I doubt that we'll be able to get to everyone's questions, but hopefully all of your questions will stimulate a really interesting conversation. So. With that, let's turn to why we are here. Um, let me just start by giving you a quote that I heard in the grand opening for the Eastern Hemisphere for the Virtual Island Summit. Uh, President David Panuelo from the Federated States of Micronesia said, a better world is not something we ask for. A better world is something we build. And to me, that statement is a perfect leaping off point for our discussion today as I'm joined by four amazing leaders, Weldon Wade, Hannah Amir, Kendra Beezer, and Yolanda Job Mori, who are taking action in their island nations to build a better world for all of us. During this session, you will learn from a scientist who's working to understand her ocean ecosystem and to inform decision-making, a communications expert who's helping communities understand the value of oceans and how to protect them, an activist who's supporting the role of youth and women in advancing climate solutions, and a politician who knows that healthy oceans um, are resilient ones and resilient oceans will continue to provide resources for generations to come. So uh, before I turn it over to our panelists, I wanna share with you a little bit about why I'm excited and what I'm hoping to learn about in this session. Um, there's two reasons why I think this session is really important. And first, uh, local leadership uh, is crucial in all of its forms. Whatever kind of work that you're doing at the local level is crucial for the long-term success of ocean management systems or really any kind of systems. Um, that said, many island nations depend upon partnerships from outside organizations or funding from outside organizations. And so I think one of the things that I'm hoping to learn from our panelists is how does the, how do you see the global community of philanthropists, of NGOs, aid organizations, others, how do they effectively share their resources and expertise in a way that supports all of you and supports the places and makes sure that um, the work is institutionalized and builds the capacity and um, the, leads from or works from the people of a given place. So that's, I think, one thing as, as an outsider, as, a, as, a, as an organization or representing an organization that works with a lot of island nations, I'm really interested to hear from you. 
but also on this call, of course, is a lot of people from all over the world who themselves are local leaders and are on the other side of this. And, and I think that we have an, an opportunity to learn from each other and that um, we, I'm looking forward to hearing from our hometown heroes on this call about what we can learn from each other and how we can take the lessons that you've learned and apply it to our own work. So our panelists join us from around the world and across three oceans. We've got Bermuda and Barbuda, two different places that are represent the Atlantic Ocean. We have the Maldives represented, uh, which of course is in the Indian Ocean and the Federated States of Micronesia in the Pacific Ocean. So we really are a global group of people here talking tonight. And it was um, you know, even tricky to find the right time that wasn't too terrible for everyone to participate. So thank you panelists for staying up late, getting up early, or for those couple of you who are happy to join in the middle of the day, thank you for that as well. Um, I'm extremely privileged to say that the Wade Institute works with governments and NGOs in all of these places. And I am super privileged to have been to and visited all of, um, not all of the islands in these places, because of course the FSM has over 600, but I've at least had the opportunity to visit these countries. And they're all very special places and the people you're gonna hear from tonight are really amazing and special people. So with that, I will stop talking. And I actually, I'm not gonna stop talking. I'm gonna turn it over to Weldon, but first I'm going to introduce him. So Weldon Wade is um, the communications coordinator for the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program. Um, he's a commercial diver and um, he's done a ton of work just as a, as a person who has tried to organize beach cleanups, he's conducted outreach. He was the community founder of Bermuda's Guardians of the Reef. And um, he has a ton of other accolades that I, I won't talk about, but I think that as he speaks, you'll get a sense of the amazing work that he's done. So with that, Weldon, I will turn it over to you. And oh, just a reminder to our panelists, if you're not speaking, let's mute ourselves so that we don't have too much background noise. Great, wonderful. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Just wanna make sure my audio is crispy first. Is everything good? Perfect. Yeah. Nice, great. Um, I am working off of notes, you guys. Um, so yeah, first of all, um, I'm really uh, grateful to, to be here. Thank you so much to James and the Island Innovation team, uh, sponsors, guests, fellow panelists, our moderator, Catherine, thank you so much, uh, and, and the Wade Institute. So it's pretty wicked to be here. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, my name is Weldon Wade. Thank you for the introduction, Catherine. I'm a, uh, I'm an avid Bermudian scuba diver, certified free diver, commercial diver, technical diver, closed circuit rebreather diver, um, explorer, ocean advocate. I'm a PADI ambassador diver, and I'm also a, a, an ambassador for uh, brands such as Pathwater and for uh, an ocean focused marine debris organization called Five Gyres. Um, and I'm also a communicator. But I have a really cool story because uh, I didn't always start out that way. In fact, I only started diving uh, in my late 20s. And there's a pretty interesting story behind that. And another interesting takeaway is my background is innovation and technology. It's not even ocean stuff. So I got, got kind of late started in my journey. Um, but it's a story I'd love to share with you. And I hope it inspires you to really um, set a precedent for, you know, you can really be anything you want to be. But essentially... Before I get into that, so Bermuda, you guys, Bermuda, which is my home, is about 600 nautical miles right off the east coast of the Carolinas in the United States. We're the, the jewel of the Atlantic, smack in the middle of, of the Sargasso Sea, um, isolated. And, and essentially, our isolation makes Bermuda um, quite unique. Um, but Bermuda is, in fact, an archipelago. It's uh, We have around 140 islands that are interconnected with bridges and a causeway. Um, about 21 square miles of land, just over 12,000 acres. So we're a really, really small country, the size of a fish hook, uh, ironically. Um, Bermuda, as you guys may or may not have heard of before, we uh, were known for uh, the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle, our pink sand beaches, um, Gulf, and we are the shipwreck capital of the Atlantic as well. So, but wherever you are on the island, when you guys visit or look us up, or whether you're a resident or a tourist, the beach is never more than a mile away. So the ocean is, is really um, our backyard. 
So, but you can imagine as a small isolated island nation, um, we, we, we do face challenges. And one of those is we really don't produce anything, right? Like everything we have is imported by ship or by plane. So if there's any disruption uh, in those services, then uh, we could find ourselves in, in a bit of a situation. And we're right in the Atlantic basin. So we're susceptible to hurricanes. And again, fortunately we're really tiny. And uh, I think right now there's probably two or three swirling around that we hope don't touch us. Um, but you can imagine a hurricane causing damage to our island and disrupting shipping channels would, would be a big issue for us. But in 1968, Baba Dioum quoted, um, in the end, we will conserve only what we, what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. So I say that to say like growing up as a kid in this island paradise, essentially, I really took Bermuda's beauty uh, for granted, you guys. Um, I remember going to the beach as a kid, but I really didn't, you know, I didn't really realize uh, how much of a gem Bermuda was until later. And that later was really when I decided to leave the island as an adult and move to Toronto, Canada and scuba diving was a bucket list item for me. So I decided to try it. And that's what I did. And it's a long story behind that. But I'll say that for another time, I immediately fell in love um, with, with the ocean. And uh, in that same sort of moment in time, I, I recognized there were threats to the ocean. Uh, there were immediate threats. There was like uh, marine debris and invasive species and other stressors that were essentially uh, negatively impacting this, this beautiful blue, green, turquoise um, ocean that I actually really fell in love with quite quickly. Um, so yeah, I did leave Bermuda and then I came back and uh, certified up with Patty and BSAC and other agencies. Um, but I recognize early on you guys, and I, I want to just touch on representation. Uh, a, a fact that I, I learned early on is like, not too many Bermudians were, were, were dabbling in the sport of scuba diving. And uh, those that were, weren't doing it often and people were falling in and love with the sport. And I was like, why? Like, what's going on? So I founded an organization uh, almost 10 years ago now called Guardians of the Reef. And we just turn passion to purpose. And I bring groups of people together and we'll dive for debris and we'll hunt invasive lionfish and turn it into a party. So we'll do that and log all our data and do all the, the, the fun stuff and then wrap it up with a party. Whether it's music, whether it's soca, reggae, we'll have Bermuda swizzle and I'll make my signature five being chili, you guys. Like, and you guys, it'll, 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 it'll be great. And maybe fillet and cook any fish, lionfish that we caught. Because over here, unfortunately, we're faced with a, an invasive lionfish invasion. So we call those um, while we're diving as well. Um, so it was, it was, you know, starting this grassroots organization, this grassroots movement. Um, and I learned kind of quickly by chance that I was really good at communication, uh, really good at coordinating and bringing people together to dive with a purpose. And, and again, it, it, it fueled the whole um, passion to purpose um, thing for me. So that is what happened. And that's how that e evolved. So the debris cleanups are something that I started that really, really brings the communi community together easily. And I know we're in a, in a pandemic paradigm right now, so it's not as easy to execute these kind of things. But before uh, COVID-19, it was really easy and really exciting to bring people together at a beach or bay or at a dock or by boat to dive against debris and use the the kit and the experience and uh, and all the classes and whatnot that we invested in to do good for uh, the environment. And um, yeah, that was the debris side. And, and it's really, really impactful on how we make that happen. And again, same with the lionfish invasion. Um, and again, keeping their numbers in check. And I don't want to talk too much about the lionfish invasion, but it's, it affects way more countries than it does um, Bermuda. So at the end of the day, it's, it's you uh, watching this live or on the replay, how can you get involved? It's really just learn how to dive and, and connect with your local diving community. Um, if you don't wanna get in the water, that's okay. Um, just recognize that there are threats to the ocean and there are things that we can do to, to help mitigate that. The ocean uh, is vulnerable you know, and our reef is under threat. This, this very reef here in Bermuda that provides a barrier for our storm surge, when we're being battered by the storms I talked about earlier, um, it supplies us with the sand, it supplies us with food. Um, we can't be sort of reluctant as these problems won't just go away. We have to take action against these uh, and do as much as we can um, about that. So that's what I do. And I have a wonderful time doing it. And other than the 
the activism and the ocean advocacy work, I think what really fuels me, what really gets me up and out of bed in the morning is getting people underwater, introducing people that have never seen what's below the surface of the ocean, put on the little, little window, little mask. It's a window to a whole nother world. You know, it's, it's almost akin to go into a circus and standing outside of the tent and looking at the tent from the outside. You got to go inside. You got to go underneath and see what's under or underneath the surface of the ocean because it's really phenomenal what's down there, you guys. So if you don't dive, if you don't snorkel, um, I suggest you, you grab a mask, snorkel, and fence and go check it out. And as Catherine hinted to earlier, I, um, yeah, all that work accumulated into a prayer coming to, you know, reality for me, being able to be in a position to be in the ocean space full time as a communications coordinator for the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program, which is a partnership between the Bermuda government, the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science, and the Wade Institute. So we hope to protect 20% of Bermuda's EEZ and help support the blue economy and create a marine spatial plan. So I wear a lot of other hats too, but I'm just super excited and super nervous to be on this live with you guys. And I could talk for like an hour and I'm going to save you guys down there and pretty much wrap it up. Thank you so much. And I'll be standing by for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. Um, so I'll, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions before we turn it over to our next panelist and I make another introduction. Um, so you talk about people getting underwater and, and yeah. the importance of that. I think that um, it's not like that's not something for everyone, right? So are, are there ways that despite I, the fact that I want everybody to be underwater also and see <laughs> experience it, like, so how do you motivate Bermudians and, and what are the big challenges or biggest challenges that you think that or that you face in, in trying to help Bermudians understand um, the threats to the ocean and, and how they can make a difference to, to prevent them? Well, I know, I know for me, um, whenever I, I, I'm asked the question similar to that, I think about my mother and my grandmother, right? These are the women that raised me. Um, my mom raised me as a single parent and my grandmother uh, took over later on. But I always think of, you know, how can I get my mother and grandmother engaged? And the easiest thing for me is to bring them along on some of the land-based adventures that I do, whether it's, it's a beach cleanup that's land-based, that's really awesome. And I involve them in that way. But other than my immediate family who I have been pulling in slowly over time, um, is really the power of the internet and the power of social media and sharing images, Use it, whether it's, it's video or, or stills, um, but just, I'm slowly evolving into, or I'm trying to be an aspiring storyteller, but there are a lot of people in the ocean space that are way better, way amazing, um, better storytellers. And I think by just using visual arts and multimedia, we're able to show, show and share things with people that we wouldn't be able to do easily without the power um, of technology and the internet and, and innovation. So for me, it's just showing people um, what's going on with, with the environment. And, you know, while most pictures I see on Instagram and Facebook tend to be really pretty pictures, um, not all of them are. And it's really, it's an eye opener when you see something um, that really triggers uh, action. And, and at the end of the day, it really boils down to making, making good choices and really with your dollar. And, uh, you know, with my family, while recycling in Bermuda is a little bit interesting, we only recycle tin, aluminum, and glass, and we burn all of our other trash. We have a, a waste, to en waste to energy program. It's what we have here. Some people argue burning plastic is a bad thing. I agree burning plastic is a bad thing, but we have to work with what we have. But I have my recycling bag and I encourage family to recycle things properly and stuff like that. So I hope I answered that question. Um, so for me, I just try to craft all my events to be all inclusive. And then I, I utilize as much power of social media and Instagram and Facebook that I can to really show the world, you know, my, my, my fellow Bermudians and the world what's going on, the good and the bad, whether it's coral bleaching, marine debris, invasive lionfish, um, ocean acidification. So as, a, so as a communicator, do you think it's important to show both the good and the bad? So I think that one of the things that, you know, I grew up with in the world of Jacques Cousteau and yeah. the amazing, amazing, wonderful things of the sea. Um, now, as somebody who has experienced the water over a period of time, I've seen some really um, 
you know, sad instances of destruction and loss. Um, uh, yeah, so what's your perspective? Do you inspire people with beauty or do you show them the good and the bad? How do you, what's the, what's the right way to go to try to communicate the urgency of what we need to accomplish? I, I try to have a, a good balance between the two, though I do prefer to share the beauty. There's a lot of beauty around us. Um, like we spoke about in my introduction, my diverse diving sort of portfolio opens me up to seeing things that a lot of regular people may not. The commercial diving that I do with a local contracting company, we do a lot of um, interesting projects. And uh, the most interesting for me revolve around our waste management systems. And I see a lot of things that I feel that Bermuda needs to improve on. But like I mentioned about our incineration system, we, we have to do what we have to do based on the land mass that we have. And, you know, we, do we landfill? Do we burn it? Do we ship it overseas? So I think we make the best choices with the cards that, that we, we are dealt in that instance. But yeah, I tend to share more of the good than the bad, but I think it's great to, to strike a balance, um, especially with the different lenses that I put on and the different things that I see. I think, um, you know, it's, it's just good to be forward and, and honest and open as possible and let people realize like the reality is you know the ocean isn't unfortunately as, as resilient as we as we think it is and um you can't just take 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 you know there has to be a a, a balance with that awesome thank you weldon and um once again i'll just encourage everyone who is listening to to think about the the things that that weldon shared with us about his experience in communications about uh, Bermuda as a place. And if you have any questions for him, you can ask them now or you can hold them for the end. Uh, my colleague Shana is hiding out on the line so that she can uh, write down the questions and share them with us so that we're able to ask questions. So thanks, Weldon. Uh, we're yeah, now thank you. going to um, go from the late night, the latest night person to the earliest morning person on this call um, or as a panelist. Uh, Hannah Amir, who is a marine biologist with the Maldives Marine Research Institute. So we're moving from the world of communications to the world of science. Uh, Hannah is uh, recently completed her master's degree and she now oversees all of the coral reef related research at the Marine Research, or the Maldives Marine Research Institute. She leads the National Coral Reef Restoration and Rehabilitation Research Program, um, which its responsibility is to assess um, the status of Maldives reefs and to improve uh, reef resilience and resistant, uh, resistance to impacts and change. So she spends a lot of time in the field, um, but as I think you will find very soon, she is also very eloquent in communicating um, the challenges that the Maldives face and what the Maldives knows and understands about its marine ecosystem. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Hannah to share some insight with us about her work. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I'd like to just uh, start off with thanking all of you guys at Island Innovation and the White Institute for giving me this opportunity. It's awesome to join a panel like this with really cool, amazing people. Um, just to straight up jump into it, um, as Catherine said, I'm Hannah. I'm a marine biologist at the Maldives Marine Research Institute. Um, the Maldives Marine Research Institute is the research arm of the, the marine research arm of the government with a very interesting history where this very tiny section in this government office with the efforts of, with the hard efforts of people in that section grew it to a center and now to an institute. And I think that also sets a bit of an example of uh, the Maldivian attitude. Um, so I wanted to speak a little bit about how I got into marine science, um, some of my motivations, challenges I've faced, and how it all translates into supporting ocean and coastal and uh, uh, protection uh, in the country and hopefully as in the wild in the wider world. So marine science was uh, and the marine environment was 
both an early and late love for me. Um, biology, ecology, all of these were early passions of mine because my mother is uh, Maria, a biologist and she teaches um, students and she passes that information down to me and it was an early part of my education in my home life. Um, my brother, when I was younger, was one of my key companions and we always used to go fishing together and those two things together built up an early life for, of the environment, biology, and somewhat of an appreciation for fish, perhaps more than we already have. But it didn't really develop into something I might pursue as a career, a career or something that I might spend more time doing a, in, a more, in a sense more than that was recreational until I got later into life. Um, and that's very much due to the people I met along the way. One of the key people was a marine biologist from um, all the way from the Baltic Sea. And she was one of my biology teachers as well. And she had such a passion for marine science. And in an instant, somehow, perhaps reflecting what Weldon was saying about realizing what a gem we live in within the islands, um, put into perspective for how much of an amazing place the Maldives was in terms of the marine environment. And then later on with my studies in university and my masters, it sort of built up this passion for marine science. And it, thinking about my journey into getting into marine science, one thing I did realize that despite us living within a whole bunch of islands. Uh, the Maldives are more than a thousand islands and archipelago spreading from north to south. We are really spatially spread. Despite us living in such an environment, we don't really actively engage too much within the marine environment. We, our education system isn't doesn't pull people into the marine sciences. It's touched upon in a very shallow way, but we don't go into it. And that's, I think, partially why I didn't get into it as early. So, and this might come as a surprise to most of you guys, because um, as you may or may not know, Maldives is often presenting at world summits, meetings, driving engagements on the global scale. But somehow that same energy doesn't seem to translate into the local level. But at the same time, I do have to acknowledge that that energy is finally starting to build up, especially with recent youth engagement, driving a lot of the efforts and energies to build communities and NGOs that clean up uh, marine environments like the beach, the mangroves, um, the reefs, um, that does independent research work either through reef check um, stuff like that. So it's building up, but it's slow going and perhaps even late going. And it, that's one of my motivators, uh, more, more motivations in uh, engaging with the marine sciences, um, because I want to foster that sense of um, that's, that energy and this sense of ownership that our marine environment is ours and it's ours to take care of and it's ours to uh, propagate and preserve for our future. Um, and that's all in addition to just a simple curiosity of what's out there, what's down there, because we know so little and we keep losing more of it. And because of that, we, because we know so little and we keep losing more of it, we, are, we have no idea of what we've lost either. And Maldives has been so spatially spread out, we've got hotspots of research of, um, of expeditions and stuff like this, but there's so much, so many at all that are very ignored and these places need the same attention and there's uh, lots to engage there. 
So that's one of the challenges here, the spatial scale that we are so spread out that each at all is unique and each at all has a unique community with their own challenges. So how we engage with them, how we encourage them is, has to be to an extent tailor-made. Um, and because we are such a small um, nation and our numbers are so low, there's often not enough people to go around to be able to face this spatial challenge. Um, there's, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the marine education is lacking. So the capacity of people who knows, who knows things and who are able to communicate those things effectively and engage with the community is quite limited. And this produces um, a situation where we are not able to be as effective as we should be. And because we are in this state of flux where we are developing and new people are coming in, there's also this perhaps drive to keep creating new things instead of perhaps developing uh, resources, uh, technical technologies, um, methods and stuff that are already exist and have somewhat of a baseline. Um, while, driven, while that's driven by, I think, very good motivations, the duplicity of um, those actions also halt um, what we need to do. Um, so with sort of that ramble putting together, <laughs> putting that ramble together, I see my role in this as a marine scientist, as someone from the government who does two main things, which is bring the scientific basis to whatever we do um, to make sure that um, we are doing something that can have effective future impacts and then disseminating and sharing the information and resources that we build up through our research to not just the government bodies who make decisions, the political um, appointees, um, all of these guys who make the high level decisions, but the locals as well, who are most affected by any sort of decision we make. So to, and through the, dissemination of that information and of those resources to build that connection that we so desperately need to make um, ocean and coastal protection in, uh, effective within this country. Um, so that's my spiel, but I'd just like to end by mentioning what keeps me inspired because our local efforts um, can be tiring, especially in the face of what's happening globally with climate change. And sometimes it feeling, it feeling like not enough and that sense of doom and why are we doing this? Um, why make all this, this effort and what's keeping me inspired, what keeps me inspired and what keeps me going during those times is something that my mother instilled at me, instilled within me, which is that not to ex accept that which we do not deserve, that we do not deserve. And what I deserve is to have an ocean to go back to, um, to have these coral reefs, to have these amazing natural beauties propagated to my children, to my nephews, my cousins. Um, and if I deserve that, my family deserves that. And if my family deserves that, everyone else in the Maldivian population deserves that. And if we do deserve it, so does everyone else who's dependent on these ocean resources. And that's all of us. So yeah. Uh, thank you, Hannah. I would say that's far from a ramble. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts and to give us a little insight about your motivation and the work that you're doing. Um, I'll ask a, a couple of questions of you as well before we uh, move on to the next panelist. Um, so 
you talked about the challenge of the lack of um, education that's focused on the ocean in the Maldives. You also talk about the fact that the Maldives is this enormous um, stretch of islands across huge distance, more than a thousand islands. Do you have do you have a vision for like how do you how do you teach people how do you train people? I imagine not everybody could be even if all Maldivians became marine scientists, it would be extremely difficult to train them. Do you have a vision, or or they wouldn't want to? You need other functions in government. How do you start to train? people at the local level across this huge stretch of, of space um, in a way that makes them want to, to see a brighter future for the Maldivian ocean and, and for the survival of the people of the Maldives? I think that's a really tough question because we, there's a lot of people to reach, but one thing I think that kind of stands out to me is reaching the kids. Um, we've got a, the marine sciences is building and we've made improvements to our education system, but I think there's a lot, more, a lot more to go. Um, so one stigma we seem to have is that marine sciences is something that someone who's not got enough um, skill or intelligence or it's the thing you do if you're not good enough and that's just not true. Um, so when and it's a thing you do if because it's easy and it's not uh, getting rid of that stigma i think is one of the main things we need to do to encourage people to go into marine sciences um there's a lot of interest especially in the young kids in the young adults um um i personally know of a lot of university kids who wants to get into marine sciences and are only just being able to get into now. It's only recently that the marine science course started at the university. Um, the Ministry of Fisheries where, um, runs this thing called uh, Fish Camp, Marine Camp, which I've had the pleasure of joining, joining up once or twice now. And the kids are so amazingly enthusiastic about sciences. Like, they want to know um like they are so curious and they are so curious <laughs> it's it's hard for me it's but there's so little room for for them to grow um they get to a certain point and they get stuck or discouraged so i think we have to intervene into that stigma and into the education system where we build them up. Uh, we don't tear them down for pursuing this passion of theirs. So I think, I mean, there's a lot other avenues we'd have to engage in, but I think that's one thing that's doable and perhaps practical. Thanks, Hannah. And, I, and I'm going to shift the question a little bit um, and ask you about your role as a scientist and um, you know, part of your job, especially as a scientist in government, is to inform government decision making. Uh, do you see the politicization of science or is there, do you run into challenges in terms of how do you remain in your role as a scientist, but also um, you know, be a human being who has uh, and, and express yourself in a way that talks about the, the consequences of actions. Like, is there, do you struggle with that or do you have a way of, of dealing with those challenges? Um, as a scientist in a government organization, I think you, you can't not struggle with it because Sometimes the science does show one thing, but the political, political drive may not necessarily agree with it. Um, but I think as a scientist, as someone who sees uh, things as what's being shown scientifically, sorry to use that word so much, you have to tailor your communication and the way you uh, putting out your results in such a way where they understand this is what's here. Um, this is what happened if we do it this way. 
this is what will happen this will, if you do it some other way um, and really break things down into scenarios and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't very eloquent, but <laughs> yeah. That was great. That was great. Well, thank you, um, Hannah, and we'll, and we'll come back to the discussion. And I think that there's also, there's been a, a question or two that's come in already and um, that we'll, we'll bring back up in the open discussion when we pull everyone in. Um, some common threads I'm hearing already are about youth and engaging youth, engaging people in the ocean, um, communicating what you know and understand uh, to the people of your communities that you work with and the places that, um, in the, the people that you work with and in the communities that you work. Um, so thank you, Hannah. And now we will jump across back over into the Atlantic or into the Caribbean Sea and hear from Kendra Beezer. Uh, Kendra, I've known for quite a while. Uh, Barbuda is um, I think I first visited Barbuda in 2013, and it is a very holds a very special place in my heart. Um, as the first place I, I worked with when I started working with the Wade Institute, um, and it's a place I think I will always go back to. Uh, Kendra Beezer is a, um, a representative, is part or a member of the Barbuda Council. Uh, the Barbuda Council is the island government for Barbuda. Barbuda is part of Antigua and Barbuda. And he sits on the Barbuda Council. He is the youngest elected member of that council. And um, previously he um, was chairman of agriculture, lands and fisher fisheries and coastal protection. Uh, he was recognized by One Young World with the Mary Robinson Climate Justice Award. Um, and has um, is now pursuing his master's degree while at the same time serving as a leader for the people of Barbuda. Um, so I will turn it over to Kendra to talk about um, his work and his experience. Kendra. You're on mute, Kendra. Sorry about that. Thank you to the Virtual Island Summit and the Wade Institute for the opportunity to be here with you tonight. As most of you in this virtual space are aware, the 14th Sustainable Development Goal of the United Nations is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources. In a letter to the President of the UN General Assembly dated the 2nd March 2020, the co-facilitators overseeing the preparatory process and the intergovernmental consultations stated that the ocean is an important source of our planet's biodiversity and plays a vital role in the climate system and water cycle. The ocean supplies us with oxygen to breathe, contributes to food security and to decent jobs and livelihoods and plays an essential role in sustainable development a sustainable ocean-based economy and poverty eradication. What happens when we ignore the universe and continue business as usual? Well, let me share a story with you now. My name is Kendra Biza and I'm a member of the Barbuda Council, the local government with jurisdiction over the island of Barbuda in the state of Antigua and Barbuda, and a first year graduate student studying environmental policy concentrating in environmental law. For me, climate change was always scientific talk until I experienced firsthand a category five plus plus hurricane. On the 6th September, 2017, our small island of Barbuda was hit by the largest hurricane to ever hit the Caribbean. It was the most terrifying experience of my life. I witnessed persons running for safety and struggling to stay alive. Miraculously, only one life was lost. Sadly, one small child on that fatal day. As a result of the hurricane's devastating impact, we encountered many losses from homes to jobs, livelihoods, communication, access to water, and so much more. In order for us to build back better, we must diversify our economy. And to do so, 
building a strong blue economy will be critical. In Antigua and Barbuda, a nation which has already faced the full brunt of climate change induced megastorms and a global pandemic, resources are being displaced, negatively affecting human health and well being. The very existence of the people on this small island developing state, which I call home, is now in serious jeopardy. The ocean has always been a source of food since the beginning of time. In Barbuda, our sea has always been central to our survival and our development via the shipment of lobster, conch, and other sea species. In fact, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, estimates that by 2030, ocean industries will employ 40 million full-time equivalent jobs with the fastest growth expected in offshore wind energy, marine aquaculture, fish processing, and port activities. Understanding that and the challenges of limited finance, human capacity, access to information and technology, in May 2018 to March 2020, I took the helm as chairman of Barbuda Council's Agriculture, Lands, Fisheries and Coastal Protection Committee. In this role, we met with various stakeholders from civil society, the private and public sector to draft a plan for the development of this industry. In collaboration with our local Fisher Folk Association, we embarked on a series of lagoon and coastal cleanups. The Barbuda Council Fisheries resumed lobster export to the European Union market in December 2018 after it failed local inspection in November 2017, directly after Hurricane Irma. The Barbuda Fisheries, we charted a new course of enforcing our coastal rules and regulations whereby we trained and uniformed all of our fisheries enforcement officers. We restored our patrol boat to strengthen our enforcement strategy. We distributed over 100 fishing parts to aid in the revitalization of our fishing industry. Through a public-private partnership, we launched a six-month internship program geared towards building capacity in our next generation of ocean leaders. Then, in 2019, our small island of Barbuda became the leading location of the Blue Prosperity Coalition at the World Ocean Summit. If this can happen in Barbuda, it can happen anywhere else. Now, more than ever, as we see leaders building up walls among nations with greater divisiveness, yet arising international issues with global scale impacts such as climate change and a global pandemic, we must combine our efforts and support each other toward the good of all mankind in the pursuit of health, safety, equity, and prosperity, including working toward the day when our ocean's resources can be used without them being used up. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra, and thank you for sharing a little bit about the where Barbuda is today and, and how you have um, used your time as a member of the council to um, motivate change and action. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I'll start with, uh, for you personally, a question about what what keeps you motivated and and how do you stay resilient in the face of the impacts that have occurred and happened in Barbuda? I mean, not only do you face the um, the regular challenges or the the ongoing loss that we see in so many places around the world, but um, Hurricane Irma it was profoundly impactful to uh, the people of Barbuda and. And yeah, so what, what keeps you moving and, and makes you keep pushing for um, a brighter future? What keeps me going is simply my belief in Barbuda and the limitless amount of opportunities that exist here in Barbuda. And that's what I keep at the end of, at the back of my head. Whenever I'm faced with challenges, I remember the goal, I remember the vision. This is my country. 
it owes me a living and it's my duty to actually do the heavy lifting. Nobody else is going to come and do it for me. So I keep that at the back of my head whenever I face rough parts. I always remember it's your home, it's your job, and it's your responsibility. Thanks, Kendra. And, uh, and along, along those lines, or thinking about as, as you look to the future, so it's you're three years out from Hurricane Irma, um, gosh, almost to the day, right? Yeah. Uh, just a, a couple of days that passed the, um, when that hit. So, so what, where is uh, Barbuda today? Do you see um, the mangroves rebounding? Have you seen, um, you know, where are the people in terms of their, um, in, are they inspired to try to recapture or rebuild um, the future for Barbuda? Definitely. Um, it's three years out and it's quite um, emotional as well as um, sentimental thinking back on Irma and the time that we're in at the moment. Um, presently in Barbuda, you're seeing nature rebounding awesome. You're seeing things getting back on its feet. But there's still a long way to go with regards to our personal recovery. There's still a lot of persons living in tents. There's still persons without access to the public supply of water. And there's still persons still grappling with the day-to-day -day struggles that comes with those inefficiencies and those um, inability of them getting back up on their feet. So there's still a long road to go. There's a lot of progress being made. There are some persons who have received homes from the European, um, European Union funded housing project. There's a lot of persons who have received um, assistance elsewhere to get back on their feet, but there's still pretty much, there's still a far way to go and um, as I said, I think we're just gonna have to be in it for the long haul. There's a lot of unnecessary politics as well involved, which is not helping the situation. But I think one of the things that Barbudans have in their favor is the fact that they're resilient and the fact that they're strong people. So I think whatever will may come, I think they're strong enough to weather the storm going forward. Thank you, Kendra, um, and thanks for sharing a bit of insight and um, just a reminder to everybody who's listening to send in your questions um, and we will get to them uh, at the end of the session. Uh, now I want to turn it over uh, to Yolanda uh, Mori, who is the founder of Island Pride at the, in the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, Yolanda is a community organizer and has been working on local climate adaptation um, and advocating for stronger climate action. Uh, she's been working in this field since 2011 and has had an incredible career already, a speaker at the United Nations um, Youth Forum and the UN High Level Political Forum. Uh, and she's an alumni of the inaugural Obama Foundation Leaders Program for the Asia Pacific. Um, so I think uh, building on, on what you were talking about, Kendra, in terms of the impacts of climate change, um, we'll now turn to somebody who's been focused um, on her career on, on trying to uh, create change and, and address the impacts and um, the challenges that we face with climate change. Landa. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Kaselelia uh, Mango. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are in the world. My warm, warm greetings from the beautiful islands of Chuuk here in the Federated States of Micronesia. It is Wednesday here, so for those of you who are still in Tuesday, hello from the future. <laughs> Been waiting all week to tell that joke. Um, to introduce myself, I am from the village of Awak in the chiefdom of U on the island of Ponpe here in Micronesia. Um, my name is Yolanda Joab Mori and I wear a few different hats. Um, the biggest one is I am a mother. Uh, I have a five-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter. 
Um, I'm a partner to my husband and I am uh, the eldest of four sisters. Um, and I'm a daughter to many, but I believe ultimately a daughter to Micronesia and a daughter to these islands uh, that I call home. And it's in that spirit and in that identity that I'm very grateful to share space on this panel with my new friends and talk a little bit um, about what that means to be a good daughter to, to Micronesia in terms of my journey and, the, and my work. And just to sort of put that to context a little bit, I just wanted to share a little bit about our culture. Um, because when I say daughter to, to these things, for me, that's a very, a very real relationship. In our cultures here in Pompeii and in Chu, um, and many other indigenous uh, places, uh, people uh, around the Pacific practice this as well that when a child is born, we actually bury the placenta in the family land or in the ancestral land. And this is a tradition that is not just practical, but it also reflects, I think, our people's very sacred and umbilical connection to our islands. Um, and it is in the act of you know, returning a part of yourself uh, to the land at the beginning of life, you become ever rooted to your home that sustains you, right? And that way the child's literally connected to their roots for, uh, for their entire life. And I think that's a beautiful part of our culture that I wanted to share because I think it's, it is this kind of a connection and the pride and the gratitude and the powerful sense of identity uh, that comes with that is what makes this kind of work so natural for many Islanders, uh, inclu including me. Um, and it's not just the connection to the land itself, um, but from Ridge to Reef, when we talk about home, it is inclusive of the ocean because it is the one thing that connects all of us, right? From, from Micronesia to the Maldives. And as an island nation, the Federated States of Micronesia is comprised of over uh, 600 islands, uh, most of which are low-lying islands with a total land combined mass of about uh, 270 square miles. Um, whereas our ocean coverage, uh, demands over 1.3 million square miles. So we really are a large ocean state versus a small island uh, developing state. I like to change the narrative a little bit there. Um, with beautiful and deeply rooted cultures and connections to our islands and to these oceans. And so I wanted to frame my discussion um, with that. And I wanted to share that story because it's important to me as a Micronesian mother to approach this work through that lens. And I think that kind of ties um, into why I have the values that I do, why I do the work that I do, um, and why I have a problem with the injustice of the climate crisis because of how it puts all of that at risk. You know, as we are on the front lines and seeing the impacts of climate change on land and below water, um, it, it has its impacts on very real issues like food security, water security, livelihoods, but also jeopardizes that very important sense of identity and culture. And just to note, the, this picture behind me is a picture I took outside my house this morning before, before I came up to the office. This is where um, my kids are growing up and learning how to swim. So this is, uh, this is as close as uh, home it gets to home it gets for me. Um, so this is why um, about 10 years ago, I started working on climate change education and adaptation. Um, for about six years, we did a program um, that focused on schools and communities. In the schools, we worked on developing a climate change-based curriculum and developing lesson plans and looking at the science behind it and talking about it in high schools and elementary schools. And the I, simple idea behind this was, you know, if, if youth and the next generation are going to be the ones to inherit the climate uh, crisis um, for their future, then they need to be talking about it and learning about it ASAP in schools now so that they could start, you know, being empowered to, to know about what kind of uh, trajectory that they wanna take in terms of what they study, when they go off to college, what kind of career paths they wanna take. Um, and then we also worked in the surrounding communities to work on developing community action plans and um, projects would come out of this like rainwater harvesting systems to build resilience to droughts, uh, coastal protection projects to build resilience to saltwater inundation um, and marine protected areas. And we went on to educate over 10,000 students and working with over 3,000 community members across the region. 
Um, this program was under an international organization with foreign aid uh, donor. So when that country's uh, politics changed and decided they didn't really you know, wanna fund or believe in climate change anymore, that program essentially got defunded, which was kind of my big first realization for why um, political will is so important. And that I became an activist to push for stronger climate action uh, globally. And it's also when my friends and I decided to start our own NGO, um, Island Pride Micronesia, so that we could continue doing that work in our own way. So with that bit of experience, there has definitely been plenty of challenges and lessons learned. I think my top three that could be versatile and uh, be applicable across the board is one, the importance of authentic community partnership. Um, two, the importance of valuing local knowledge. And three, the importance of youth and women's involvement. And I can talk a bit more about these throughout the discussion, but I wanted to highlight those now. But you know, despite all of these challenges and learning things the hard way a lot, I'm constantly inspired um, by my family, by my colleagues, by my kids, and by the countless other uh, Micronesians, both mentors and peers, who share the same values and who have been putting in the work to show it. Uh, yesterday, I was very proud to see my president uh, speak during the, during the opening ceremony and talk about all the great work that's happening here in the region. Um, mentioning the Micronesia Challenge, uh, our new partnership with the Blue Prosperity Coalition, and so much more. And so I think it's a really inspiring time uh, to be involved because I think the leadership is there. I think the momentum is there. And I'll just end uh, with a quote from um, one of my best friends who is a true ocean champion, uh, Jasmine Mendiola. And uh, she said, um, we can never do the ocean justice for how it serves us. And that means anyone um, and the ocean plays critical roles in both uh, the water cycle and oxygen cycle. So that means anyone who drinks water and breathes needs the ocean. And this proves how connected we are to the ocean and how it is an essence of life that flows within us. We undoubtedly cannot live without it. So at the very least, we can give it the respect that it so deserves. And I think that kind of captures the essence of how we view being a daughter to Micronesia and what that's all about. So I'll end it there. And I look forward to the discussion uh, to come. Thank you and galangan. Thank you so much, Yolanda. That was great. Um, I, um, so I have a couple of questions for you before we shift gears um, and open it up to everyone. Um, so, so you, um, Sorry, I have a child next to me. I also have a child. <laughs> yeah. I have a screen behind me. There are people wandering around the background who are. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if you can um, talk a little bit more about um, being authentic and the importance um, of authenticity in the work that you do. So how does that like, mm. Can you dig a little deeper on that for us and tell us what you mean by that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so authentic community partnership, I think that's something um, really important that I learned along the way is how important it is for initiatives to be truly community led and community driven um, for, for things to be sustainable and to be authentic and, and, and to work and be effective. You know, I've seen and been in situations where organizations would just come in and be fixated on just ticking off their boxes and following their strict timeline and kind of make a mess of following cultural protocol and not and really not approach the situation as equal partners but like with some kind of weird savior complex that I think doesn't doesn't pave the way for authentic uh, relationships so and, and so I've seen projects that would get set up and then, and then not last. And, and, and I think, so I think it's really important for community members to be involved every step of the way from the beginning, from the design and the inception phase uh, to capacity building to the implementation, because without that sense of ownership, um, it, isn't, it isn't sustainable and it isn't a true reflection to what the community needs are. So I think authentic engagement really means 
going in with um, the intent to listen and, and the intent to learn and to build trust and to foster a relationship um, that really uh, values uh, what exists uh, in the com and what strengths already exist in the community already because I think there's so much value in this bottom-up approach and grassroots movements um, feeding up you know to up to the policy level and I just wanted to kind of segue into there was other and I think that uh, connects really well to the second um, biggest lesson learned that I've had which is about valuing local knowledge and I can't, I can't emphasize that enough um, because it ties, it ties in very much with you know, authentic community engagement. And there is so much, there is so much to be said about the local knowledge that exists in communities already and within our elders. And you know, when you when we do community action planning, it isn't about going in and being like, oh, we're here to teach you this and save the day it's 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 not like that it shouldn't be like that it should really be based off the question what can we learn from you and what can you teach us and i think when we have these kinds of conversations you build trust and and you acknowledge that there's something to learn and something valuable there in the traditional knowledge and in the traditional um practices that have been passed down um throughout the generations um i wanted to share uh one example here because it really shows how you know a lot of the things that we have here in Micronesia and in, in indigenous cultures really translate into modern conservation methodologies, you know? Um, here in Chuuk, there's a practice called metzen, when during a family funeral, um, the family essentially put a ban on harvesting from uh, the family land and the ocean for an extended period of time, which would allow for these areas to recuperate. And this has been practiced you know, since, since ever since, and that is by definition what we call today a marine protected area. So I think it's so important that we place higher value on uncovering and translating these kinds of things because we realize that there's so much untapped wisdom um, that is already here. Wonderful. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, so we have, it's, it's just after, well, we have 20 minutes left. I was going to give you the time, but it occurred to me that everybody's in a different time zone. So that's probably uh, not so relevant, but we do have another 20 minutes. And I, I wanted to take the opportunity to um, first say thank you all and to highlight some of the things I've heard in the, the comments so far and really open it up to, to first the panelists to ask each other questions and then, um, and then turn it out over to the other questions that I know have rolled in from the people listening. Um, but some of the threads that I think came across in, you know, you all come from very different places um, and you have, you do different work. Um, and so I think that it's um, telling that there's been, there's common threads and themes in what you've identified in your presentation. Um, first, uh, I think all of you address the issue of communication and, and in, at different levels, whether it's um, communicating you know, as a communicator, as, as a scientist, um, how to communicate across different stakeholders, um, internal communication versus communicating with the world um, or people with outside organizations. Um, the importance of the youth and engaging the youth. Mm. That they have, um, it's, it's really about the youth's future, right? Like they have more at stake, I think, than the rest of us because they have a longer time to, live on this planet and we need to um, give them, do our best to make sure that they have mm -hmm. the best future possible. And there's been several comments about education and the importance of education, whether it's uh, formal education at the, at the level of um, children or adults or community or education um, with the public and, and bringing them a sense of ownership of the ocean. Um, and I think that one of the things and one of the reasons that uh, we wanted to host this panel as, as you really drove the point home, Yolanda, is about local knowledge and valuing uh, the communities um, and the, the people who live in a place are in the best position to know and understand that place. And I, th I don't think that means that there isn't technical work that can be done or there can't be great partnerships with outside organizations, but I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to, 
to help um, design those those programs in the best way we can. So um, I will I could ask like ten more questions, but I'm going to stop because I really want to give all of you a chance to ask each other questions. So I, I know that Hannah had a question for the panelists, so I'm going to pick on her first and and give her a chance to ask a question, and then um, and then we'll turn it over to others. I, I guess um, the question I had, which you all have uh, touched on um, in your talks as well, was the question I had was, um, how you guys uh, navigate uh, different op opinions and motivations to accomplish your common goal? Who wants to take a stab at that? Kendra, we can't hear you. Repeat. Um, how um, how do you know, know, uh, navigate different opinions and motivations to accomplish a common goal? Can you stump them? Yeah, well done, please. Well then, Mike. Cool. I was waiting for somebody behind the scenes to unmute me, but yeah, um, <laughs> you know, for, for me, um, navigating the different opinions of different, you know, individuals, organizations, groups, and entities is definitely a skill. And um, and forgive me because I'm still reeling from Yolanda's talk about authentic community partnerships and ownership um, and uh, valuing local knowledge. So I just want to say thank you for that. But to answer your question, Hannah. Um, it's really, to me, um, active, active listening, really listening to, to everyone that's at the table and recognizing that not everyone at the table is, is everyone that you need to, to hear from and, and speak with. So what's been very, um, in terms of like having a strategy and uh, not coming at it tactically, but my strategy has always been to not rush into things listen to everyone at the table, if it, if it means going to the doorstep um, and collecting data and using different different platforms to, to aggregate everything and um, collating all that together and, and finding a common ground, common voice um, and common mission and just find alignment in that way. Um, that's what's been, that's what works for me. Thanks, well done. Kendra, I know you've had experience from differing viewpoints. You can't be a politician without facing how to deal with those. You must have some ideas about um, how to how to carve a path and um, arrive at the destination that you're hoping for. Definitely, and I think um, Weldon touched on it beautifully with regards to um, what he was referring to when he said actively listening and um, not every voice that comes to you is a voice that you should actually go with. And I think it starts also with um, respect, respecting everyone who is sitting at that particular table, because regardless to how small they are, regardless to how big they are, they do have a contribution to make by them being at that table. So, and as long as you're able to do that, I think you'll be able to build on top of that. Thanks, Kendra. Yolanda, do you want to take a crack at that one as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think going off of that, uh, what, uh, what Weldon also uh, mentioned about you know, not usually uh, not everyone is is at the table. And I think that came up a lot um, throughout um, everyone's discussions, um, the importance of youth engagement. And I think that's what has worked uh, for me here. Um, when youth um, become empowered and, and are provided with the opportunities um, to use their voice and, and, to, and to get involved, um, we see it, it has a huge impact on, on, you know, on the community and on decision makers. And I think it, it's a very powerful way to, to bring to light the urgency of these kinds of issues. 
Um, so I think that's one really important way that I've been able to tap into is really getting youth involved and bringing, to, bringing them to the table. Awesome, thanks Yolanda. Um, and do other, do other panelists have questions for panelists before I turn over to the questions from the people listening? All right, well, um, I will then turn to some of the questions that have been asked. Um, so I, this once again um, builds on one of Yolanda's comments um, about the, the notion of having authentic partnerships. Um, and, and, and really I think addresses the cases where um, maybe don't, that weren't authentic. So the question is, do any of you based on your experiences have strategies to transition community members who are on the receiving end of past projects to now take ownership of ongoing outcomes of those past decisions? So whether or not they were part of the process, how do you, if you have a project that you are now at the end of, try to motivate uh, people to pick that up and carry it forward? Does anybody want to grab that one? Kendra, you've unmuted. I feel like that means you wanted to say something. <laughs> but no, now he's not unmuting. Well, then you're talking, but you're muted. Yolanda. Is, yeah, is, I feel like something weird's happening. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's a great question for, that's why I think it's so important, as I mentioned, um, for community involvement to be from day one and for the projects itself to be to be designed in partnership with with community members. Um, so rather than just going in and being like, here's a solution for you, this is your project, uh, you can have it. Um, getting to know what the needs of that community, what do people actually want? What do people actually need? What are people actually passionate about and want to see what kind of change do they want to see in their, in their community? And I think when you have that, and then when um, capacity building is incorporated and you provide the tools um, needed, whether it be technical support or advice, um, then that I think um, really builds up the sense of community ownership because it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not like something you're just dropping off like like a gift or, or, do, or a donation, but it's something that is owned because it was built and designed by 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 us. And I think that's one way uh, to help with that. Thanks, Yolanda. Weldon? I can't hear you. Yeah, you know I think for for different things I've worked on, um, and this is sort of springboarding off of Yolanda, um, stakeholder engagement in the genesis of, 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 of the thing has a lot of value, but what I wanted to really touch on was, you know, Bermuda, and I don't know how this applies to all other island nations, but we're on island time. And, you know, things do take a little bit longer to get done around here, you know, if you wanna... <sighs> You know, you want to order something from Amazon. It's it's not going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to take like a week. Um, you know, if it doesn't get sent to another country by mistake, like something I just had shipped, it went to the Bahamas instead of Bermuda, and it's been there for a month. Um, but I just think when it when it comes to, when you boil it down, it's really about um, recognizing that not everyone is on the same pace of mm. things. Um, having, you know, genuine, authentic stakeholder engagement from the beginning and, you know, having respect for everyone that comes to the table, but typically that what you see isn't what you get. There's going to be people in the outskirts that may have been jaded from experiences of the past that don't want to get involved because, you know, around here, you know, it's usually the same people, we sort of call it like the choir, that come out to get involved with ocean activism. It's the same people. So it really does take a you know, a good communication strategy, um, 
you know, even advertising in a newspaper where some people think newspaper is dead, but there is a segment of our community here that still reads the Royal Gazette, um, still listens to the radio, you know, not everyone is on social. So yeah, that's kind of what I want to say to that uh, wonderful question. Uh, that's how, you know, things are around here at least. Thanks, Weldon. Um, and I, um, I want to turn to another question um, and, and shift the questions or the discussion just a little bit. But before I do, I wanted to flag for everyone that um, if you look at the backgrounds that we have here, um, each, each person has a background that represents the place that they live. So you're seeing um, with Kendra, the pink sands of Barbuda that are truly pink and amazing. Um, Hannah has a background from the Maldivian coral reefs. And of course you're seeing the reef system in Bermuda and, and Yolanda has already spoken about the place that she is. I am, um, for those of you who've been to San Diego, you know that I didn't, I don't have a San Diego background, um, but I picked one of our other project sites that I love, Tonga, which is very near and dear to me also. And I decided that that was gonna be my home background for the discussion, um, for this discussion. Um, so we, so there's all these really amazing, incredible uh, systems, um, and I think all the people on this call work in tropical reef systems that, of course, are facing incredible impacts from climate change. And um, I'll just one of the questions for Hannah is about the impacts in the Maldives. So um, we'll shift gears entirely away from communication and engagement and how to work with community to the world of science and you know, what what do you know and understand or can you give us the the 30,000 foot view about what what the Maldives is facing in terms of climate impacts? Oh man, it, it, that's a big question. Why do they keep directing big questions at me? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think on a broad scale, um, there's those impacts everyone knows about the sea level rise, um, in, uh, change in weather patterns and all of those things. Um, as someone who's living here, it's a bit more real. Um, and there are some subtle things I think that don't get flagged or don't get talked about as much in terms of climate change challenges. And one of those challenges at least that we are really starting to see now is uh, changes in weather patterns as well. Um, we are fortunate enough to not be in any, as of yet, knock on wood, to not be in the face of cyclone typhoon parts yet, but anyone, that, again, touching back on what Yolanda and Weldon and Kendra have all spoken about local knowledge, a lot of the locals, especially those of the older generation are noting how these traditional weather patterns have altered now. Um, we are not uh, following things as they used to be. Um, some of the pattern patterns in terms of rainfall, dry seasons have changed out. So, but in terms of climate change, though we've noticed these patterns, they aren't as scientifically recorded, but these changes are happening and these things are affecting the um, local livelihoods, some um, fisheries, tourism, stuff like that. Um, in terms of the more traditional talks, um, in terms of uh, rises in sea level rise, sea level rise, um, rises in sea surface temperatures. Obviously for us, the impacts on the coral reefs are huge. Um, the 1998 bleaching, the old one, um, that devastated our reefs and it took maybe 10 -ish or more years for us to be in a place where we uh, were able to sort of start thinking they have recovered. We went from a 98% to maybe 50, 40%, uh, uh, sorry, a 98% loss and then climbed back up to maybe 50, 40% in average coral color. And then we got hit by the 2016 bleaching event. And now we're in a place where we may not recover as one would expect over time because all these climate change impacts are changing the oceanography, the ocean systems and all of those things that would help eventually recover the system. But 
it's in a state of flux. Um, so there's, I guess the main climate change difficulty challenge impact for us is that what in a place where we had local knowledge, but then didn't have scientific knowledge. Um, we are in a place where, in a place of uncertainty, where the local knowledge is starting to sort of fail us because things are changing so rapidly and without the scientific back in there to sort of give us trajectories and stuff, it's all wonky. Um, so for us, the challenge is the uncertainty. Um, we can build off of um, the local knowledge, we can build off of on some of the scientific knowledge we've got, but how do you account for something that's so strong and is rapidly accelerating? Um, yeah. Well, thank you for taking on the tough question and, and giving a little bit of insight. Um, the, the extremely short answer to a, a question that is probably thousands of pages worth of information that is possible to share. Um, so I'll, in speaking about um, the impacts that all of you face uh, on your islands and the very real impacts from climate change as it relates to the ocean, uh, I'll ask one more question that was asked by one of the, um, one of the participants in the meeting. Um, so for those people from continental countries who are the main countries responsible for climate change, what important actions should we be taking to um, support you and your work um, and your islands? And that one's for everyone. Yolanda, you look like you're going to um, going to unmute and give us an answer. Am I unmuted now? Okay. Um, great question. Um, the first thing that pops to, into my head is vote for leaders who prioritize climate action and supporting uh, and yeah, I think that's one of the most important things that people can do um, to, to support this uh, um, globally. It's so important to have the political will and to have the leadership. You know, we talk about um, here in the islands, like saying things like, you know, every small step counts and it's, and it's so important. And that is really true. But I think it's, it depends on where you are and who you are. And uh, for places and people that can make leaps, um, you need to leap. Um, you know, and I think we need we need people in leadership, um, especially in these in countries that are the bigger com contributors um, to global carbon emissions, uh, that are serious about climate change and that recognize its urgency. So I think that's the first thing that popped into my head is is putting in leaders into office that that take this seriously and then and will take decisive action on it. Awesome, thanks Yolanda. And with our one remaining minute, does somebody else want to take that question on? Hannah. Um, I think bringing it, tying it back to what I think has, I think the main theme, that's become the main theme of this talk is communication and listening. Um, for the continental nations for to listen to what the island nations are saying what uh, what uh, the impacts are what needs to happen and what the priorities are to be effective in whatever decision making making that needs to happen i think to be active and listen to what we are all saying because it's us who bear the impacts of um, and the consequences of everyone the harshest Thank you, thank you, Hannah, um, for that. And um, I think that we'll, it's seven, it's 7.30, it's half past the hour, wherever you are in the world. Uh, and I, I just, as a wrap up, first of all, a logistical um, comment, we clearly didn't get to 
all of your questions or even nearly as many as I had hoped. Um, although I think that we had a really engaging conversation. Uh, if you look in the comment stream, um, Shana Brody, one of my colleagues has noted that you can send questions to her and she'll try to reach out to the panelists to get answers or, um, or you can follow up with her directly to try to, to get any of your questions answered if you have additional questions for our panelists. Um, I want to uh, say thank you to all the panelists. I think that um, just to, to highlight once again, some of the key issues that I heard, um, in addition to learning about the, the work that you all are do doing, I think that for those of us who are supporting islands and island communities, um, I hear you when you say that, that one, that we have to have authentic partnerships, that we need to work with um, local communities, local organizations and support them, not just work with them. I think that we have an obligation to um, do, our, do what we can to uh, make sure that they have the resources that they need to achieve success um, at the local level, because that's going to eventually lead to a global scale in terms of action. And that um, we also have an obligation to listen and hear um, from islands and island communities if we are living in places that are, um, are hugely impactful for the globe. So there's climate change, but there's a lot of other ways that I think um, we all are impacting at a global scale or collectively and cumulatively. And so um, it's important to hear the voices of the very small nations in places like Barbuda um, to know and understand that the impacts that they're facing are driven by um, a world of people who, um, who have an opportunity to make a difference. So um, I thank you all for taking the time. And um, I just wanna give a huge shout out to our panelists for sharing some of their insights. And um, I hope that this has been inspiring for everyone who's listening and um, that you able, are all able to achieve great successes in your work um, on islands and um, especially in the water in the ocean. So thank you all. And I, I will just sign off for all of us. <laughs>